We need to continue looking at modeling mechanical systems. Now we're going to move on to rotational mechanical systems. So here's an example of one. Instead of translating, these objects are rotating around this axis shown. So this could be like uh, a DC motor, for example, um, a drill, anything that's rotating. And we're going to model that in the frequency domain. So this analysis is the same as translational systems, except here torse, torque replaces force. So we're going to use tau instead of uh, F. Uh, capital tau is, just looks like a capital T. So we use that whenever we take the Laplace transform. And angular displacement replaces translational displacement. So our variable is going to be theta instead of x. And we have the same components, so a spring, a damper, except moment of inertia now replaces mass, so we're going to have I instead of M. So our impedance with S, the S squared impedance is going to be inertia instead of mass. And again, this figure doesn't quite have the same notation that we're going to use. So just like in translational systems, we can have independent motions with uh, rotational systems. And we test that by rotating a segment while holding the other still. So in this system, we can rotate this segment here um, while we hold this segment still. So theta 1 and theta 2 are independent motions. So we can rotate theta 1 while we hold theta 2 still. Now one thing that is tough about rotational systems whenever we're working on paper is drawing drawing them well. And so when we assume a positive direction, we're going to follow the right-hand rule. So if we were to assume positive being to the right, then that would mean that this object, the top of it, would rotate towards you. Because following the right-hand rule, if we were standing on this wall looking at it, it would rotate in a counterclockwise direction. And I'll show that in a little bit with the camera and my right hand. And again, one difference in rotational versus translational systems is that the free body diagrams are going to show torques instead of forces. So let's look at an example. Say we have a rod and it's relatively long and we're applying a torque at one end. So tau. And following the right-hand rule, that torque rotating in this direction means it's rotating, uh, your right thumb would point in the direction of the, the torque, and then your fingers would curl in that direction. So this means that this uh, rod, if we were standing over here, would look like it was rotating counterclockwise. So this would be positive. We're going to assume that's positive. So your right thumb would point in the direction and then your fingers would curl in that direction. Okay. So this rod is supported by two bearings, one at each end. And there's some friction between the rod and the bearings. So we've got C1 and C2. Now, say we want to find the displacement of the rod as the torque changes. If this were a rigid body, then the di displacement at any point on the rod would be the same, so it wouldn't matter where we were applying the torque and where we were looking at the displacement. But we're going to model the compliance of this rod. So let's redraw this as a schematic. So here's the friction between ground and the rod. So there's a damper, C1. And we're going to divide the rod in two. We'll, pr we'll assume that it's half of the inertia is on one end, and then there's a spring connecting that to the other half of the inertia. So this would be J1, a spring, constant K, and J2. And then we've got this damper between this end of the rod and ground. So that would be C2. Okay, so there's our schematic for this system. Oh, I left off the torque, so we're applying the torque here. 
on this end of the rod. <clears throat> so again, that means the torque pointing that way means that it's rotating about my right thumb. So it'll be curling, the top would be curling towards you. So if you're standing over here, it would look like it was going in the counterclockwise direction. And we need to choose positive displacements for our independent motions. So we have two independent motions, and we'll let those be positive to the right. So theta 1, theta 2. And now the next step in the analysis is to draw the free body diagram. So here we've got the motion at theta 1. So we've got the inertia J1. Mm, we have the applied torque. And we're going to imagine that this motion is held fixed and we're rotating theta 1 in the positive direction. So this is rotating like that. And we want to see what forces re would result. So there's going to be a force trying to keep it from rot spinning that way, so it's going to go to the left. So that will be C1 theta 1 dot. And then there's another force from the spring resisting that motion, so the spring is going to try to push it back that way. So that would be K theta 1 dot. And now we want to hold theta 1 fixed and move theta 2 and see if there are any forces resulting here at theta 1. So if we hold this fixed and rotate theta 2 in the positive direction, then the spring is going to pull on theta 1, so it's going to pull on it. So that will be a rotation like that. So that's K times theta 2. So Newton's second law, we get that negative C1 theta 1 dot minus K theta 1. Oops, that should be just theta 1, not theta 1 dot. Plus K theta 2 is equal to tau. And free body diagram on the at the second motion. So J2. Oh, oops. So this should be plus tau. So the sum of the forces is equal to the moment of inertia times theta 1 double dot times the angular acceleration. So we've got k theta 2, c2 theta 2 dot, and k theta 1. And that gives us the equation k theta 1 minus k theta 2 minus c2 theta 2 dot is equal to j2 theta 2 double dot. <coughs> so now we need to, yeah I was moving the mouse around because my screen went black and I didn't, I don't know yet if uh, the screen recorder goes black or not. So I was waking up my screen, if you were, in case you were wondering why the mouse was moving around. Now we need to take the Laplace transform so that we could get the transfer function. So we want to find g of s is equal to theta 2 of s divided by tau of s. Okay. So we have negative c1 s theta 1 minus k theta 1. And I'm sticking with the convention that the capital letter would be the Laplace transform of the function. So capital theta 1 plus k theta 2 plus tau is equal to j1 s squared times theta 1. And rearranging that we get the sum of the impedances again. So j1 s squared plus c1 s plus k times theta 1 minus k times theta 2 is all equal to the sum of the applied torques. So tau is the only applied torque. Laplace transform of the Second differential equation here, 
um, just gives you negative k times theta 1 plus j2s squared plus c1s plus k times theta 2 is equal to 0. So this is again in the form ax equals y. So we can solve for theta 2 and that's the determinant of that matrix. So this coefficient matrix A replacing the second column with the vector Y divided by the determinant of A. So this is equal to K times tau divided by J1S squared plus C1S plus K. So I didn't write out A matrix. Mm, so A is equal to J1S squared plus C1S plus K negative k, negative k, and j2s squared plus c2s plus k. So it just comes from these two equations here. <clears throat> okay, so there's the determinant a. And what we get for the transfer function g of s is theta 2 over tau, we end up with k in the numerator, and expanding this all out we get s times j1 j2 s cubed plus c2 j1 plus c1 j2 s squared plus <coughs> c1 c2 plus k, j1 plus j2 times s plus k, c1 plus c2. So there's our transfer function relating the displacement of this end of the rod with the input torque. And so again, the process is the same. We assume positive, as with translational systems, we assume positive directions. It's just that now these positive directions refer to the uh, rotation using the right-hand rule. So direction your thumb points when your fingers rotate about that axis. And the free body diagrams now have torques. And instead of mass, the impedance, mechanical impedance for a rotation would be uh, the inertia. So a moment of inertia J. But it's the same <clears throat> process. We end up with the same sort of equations where we sum the impedances at motion 1 and then subtract the impedances between the two motions, etc., etc. And we can solve for the transfer function using Kramer's rule. <coughs>